Hej, jeg hedder Marie, og jeg øh, er en del af ungdomsredaktionen på Copenhagen Dogs. Vi har valgt at arbejde med filmen The New Corporation, fordi vi synes, den giver en mega vigtig indsigt i nogle af verdens allerstørste problemer lige nu. Filmen viser os globale problemer, øh, konsekvenserne af global kapitalisme, problemer med social ulighed, med korruption og med klimaforandringer, og giver os en enorm frustration og vrede, når vi ser den, men samtidig lyst til at gøre modstand. Men problemet er også, at man også kan føle sig rimelig handlingslammet over for nogle af de her problemer. Så vi har valgt at strukturere en debat, som vi øh, har inviteret nogle personer ind, der inspirerer os, og måske kan være med til at inspirere jer derude, øh, til at vende den her frustration og vrede til noget øh, konkret og til en mulighed for at skabe forandring. Debatten monereres af Henrik Tjulo, som er øh, rådgiver hos Cybernauterne. Og vi håber, den sætter gang i noget i jer. Velkommen til. On behalf of Copenhagen uh, Docs, to everyone joining this stream, welcome and thanks for watching. My name is Henrik Chulu, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes, where we dig deeper into some of the issues that are raised by the unfortunately necessary sequel to the 2003 documentary, The Corporation. With me here by video call, I have a panel of four smart guests that will help me answer some of the many pressing questions that the film has left me with. We have Jasmine Sanders, who is executive director of our climate, uh, climate policy advocacy nonprofit based in Washington, DC. We have a uh, former state legislator in uh, Massachusetts, Solomon Goldstein Rose, who joins me from Amherst, Massachusetts. He's a politician and an the author of The 100% Solution, A Plan to Solve <laughs> Climate Change. From elsewhere here in Copenhagen, I'm joined by Christian Weisse, the General Secretary of Oxfam IBIS, a charitable, a charitable organization working for social economic justice. And finally, I'm happy to welcome one of the two directors of the film, Joel Backen. Thank you for joining us, and thanks for another jarring look into the economic and political engine room of our planet. First of all, I'd like to ask you, Joel, as filmmakers, you had an incredible amount of access. We see uh, a lot of subjects including people react to who were part of the first film reacting to your uh, to your to how the the co original the corporation presented the this form of, of structure as a, a psychopath how have you screened it for the for the particip participants in the original movie and how are they reacting to the new one i mean at this point some of the participants in the original uh film have have seen this film but we haven't sort of done an official screening we've sent out screeners to people uh you know some of them have reacted uh very very well to it um i haven't heard any reactions from uh the the so-called so other side the the business community that we criticize about the film uh, though i did get a, a call uh from klaus schwab the head of the world uh economic forum which were somewhat critical of in the film uh, and in my book. The film is based on a book that I wrote, published by Penguin Random House. Um, and he had read the book, uh, which um, sort of dealt with a lot of uh, the interview that I did with him and Davos and all of this same kind of stuff you see in the film. Um, and, you know, we respectfully agreed to disagree. Um, you know, I conceded to him that I thought his desire to change the world for the better was real. Uh, and he conceded to me that he thought mine was, but uh, we agreed that we had very different ideas about how to move forward. Uh, and his idea uh, and the World Economic Forum's idea and the corporate elite's idea for how to move forward um, is for large publicly traded for-profit corp for corporations to take the lead on social and environmental issues while democratically elected governments recede further and further uh, into the background, which is obviously what we criticize in the film. Yes, and there, there's a lot of footage 
uh, and very tightly uh, spliced together both interviews and and sort of documentary on sort of fly on the wall type scenes and lots of diagrams and 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 uh, news articles and so on there must be a lot of stuff that you also left on the cutting room floor to so to speak like how there would be a, how wouldn't there be a long unabridged version of this that would get even deeper into the many different quagmires so to speak that we we are left in at the moment I mean, I think the unabridged version of this film would probably run about 200 hours. Um, it was a, a massive, massive undertaking in terms of the footage that we shot, in terms of the footage that we collected for uh, from sort of stock archives. Um, the fortunate thing for me as, as a creator, as a writer uh, and director of this film is that it is based on a book and in, in the book, and I wrote the book and made the film at the same time. So the book is sort of digesting, dealing with laying out um, the the same material. And and fortunately, in a 250 page book, it's um, there's a lot more room to go a lot deeper and a lot wider uh, than there is in a in a just over 90 minute film. So um, so that's great. And you know, I would encourage people who want to delve deeper into the issues um to uh to to read the book um we also have a website where we're going to start trying to put up some of the fuller interviews some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor but as a filmmaker i think it's it's really important to try to create a, a narrative um that is digestible in a reasonable setting especially these days when people's attention spans tend to be trained more by, you know, three minute YouTube clips or three second YouTube clips. So doing a long narrative film, um, I, I think you're, you're always fighting these sort of contradictory impulses uh, to keep it relatively tight, um, but at the same time cover as much as you can. And I think the, the way that you can, in a way, achieve both of those things is to have a very strong analytical backbone uh, to the film, and and that's what we tried to do here. Thanks. Um, I'd like to move on to you, Jasmine Jasmine Sanders from Our Climate. In this film, we see a, a range of corporate harms a along along a series of different issues regarding gender, regarding uh, class, regarding race. Can you talk about how these all come together in this sort of final boss of the global climate uh, climate crisis? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. And I love that that terminology, the final boss, um, the climate crisis. Um, normally, when we had talked about climate change in the past, um, we just talked about the impacts being the environmental and the economical impacts. We didn't really dive into um, these other risks, um, such as migration, health, food insecurity, housing, um, mental, uh, racial, sociocultural. Um, and one thing to know is that climate change disproportionately impacts certain groups of people. Um, it disproportionately impacts frontline communities. This includes communities of color, low income communities and coastal communities. 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers off a coast. So when we are talking about hurricanes are increasing, and now you have to not just be prepared for a hurricane, but you have to be prepared for the unsurvivable storm surges, then you are talking about, um, are you going to be able to uproot your family's life when your home is taken away? Are you going to be able to start over um, because your business has now gone under? Um, you know, they are now reporting that climate change is going to cost the world $7.9 trillion by 2050. What is that going to cost the individual or the family unit? So all of these different impacts and risk um, that I named, they are all interconnected. And those certain um, groups within frontline communities, but then you also have um, different individuals. So women, you know, women are disproportionately um, and inequitably um, in this world. From the moment that we pop out of the womb, we, we are in an inequitable world. Um, here in the U.S., we deal with, you know, the gender pay gap. Um, you also have where there are disabled people, um, children. These, these are some of the most vulnerable persons out there. 
And so if we are not um, staying aware of all of these intersecting effects and the different inequities that have already been in place thus far, then we're not going to actually get to those creative solutions. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to you. Solomon Goldstein Rose. There's this quote from a famous American anarchist, Lucy Parsons, who says that you should never be deceived that the rich will allow you to vote away their wealth. You've run and been elected to public office. How do you combat the counter, the despair, or the nihilism that that sort of is is sort of the back the backdrop of a lot of these these issues that they seem insurmountable for a lot of people, right? Yeah, a, a lot of people who might be climate activists aren't because they think, oh, it, it's been so hard, we're never going to be able to solve it, and that is dangerous. And we could in include a lot more people in a movement by exciting people. I think it's starting to happen. I think youth movements in the last two or three years, like our climate, like the Sunrise Movement, have really changed the political discourse. And we're so much more focused on climate change in the US and I think also around the world than we were. And it, the actual policymaking is starting to catch up in terms of the level of ambition. It's not all the way there yet, but it's getting there. So I'm hopeful. I think one thing that has helped a lot is focusing the rhetoric less on this is a problem, an environmental problem uh, or an abstract problem that we need to do something to solve. And it implies that it's going to be a sacrifice to solve um, and instead focusing on what does it actually look like to solve and the whole Green New Deal framing, um, but also the Biden climate plan and many others focus us on rolling out new clean energy infrastructure. That's creating jobs, that is reducing inequalities, and that is reducing emissions. And so the solutions are really exciting across political ideologies. You don't even have to use the phrase climate change. And that more effective messaging that's taken hold, I think is giving people hope that the politics can be shifted. So communication is important. I'll move on to you, uh, Christian. In the solutions presented in the movie, or the, the suggestions for, for solutions, it focuses a lot on organizing to restore state power to the electorate. But what what is the role of the NGO sector in this? How do you, in your representative, so to speak, of civil society, so in the in the movie we see how the corporate endgame is total control. That's one of the, 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 that's the sort of end of the playbook. So what should civil society's endgame be here? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Stanko? I'm sorry, I think I'm the one who was uh, muted it, yes. here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, sorry. Thank you. Uh, well, I think the first the first step and the first task is to, you know, to remember that elec elections take place every fourth year usually. Uh, but the struggles around how our world look and how our societies develop take place every day. So the, the, the key job for NGOs and for civil society is to be at the back of politicians or at the throat of politicians on a daily basis and, and make sure that they're making the right decisions and that they don't only, that they're not only lobbied and that, that they're not only fed ideas uh, from the corporate world because we know that that happens on a daily basis. So I would say that's the, that's, that's, that's one task. The second is the agenda setting. I mean, the policies that we see enacted around the world basically come from what's in the media as well and what we can see that there's a kind of consensus about. And But there's a fight about the agenda and there's a fight about the consensus. Uh, and that's that's something that civil society take part in as well. And I, then I think a third and very central element is to organize alternatives. Uh, I mean, what we've been seeing in this movie is, is what multinational corporations look like and how they work and uh, also in, in what way they want to, you could say, uh, form the future, uh, but there's counter organizing taking place on a daily basis. There are workplaces that are organized by cooperatives where the workers who work there actually own the workplace itself. 
Uh, there are people who are farming in different ways, ecologically and so on. Uh, there are people who are taking care of their communities, uh, their, their, their most vulnerable populations and so on in alternative ways. And most often that's being done by civil society as well. Uh, so, so I think that's, uh, that's the third part of it. And um, in this film, I'll just open this up to the whole panel. So in this film, we see a long list uh, of what you would call toxic behaviors that are very similar to what you would see in a, in a sort of abusive relationship of a romantic relationship, you know, surveillance, uh, control, gaslighting, and uh, you sort of general psychological violence. And traditionally, when you analyze the, the harms of capitalism, um, this has been based on an economic analysis, which is also strong, I think, in this, this movie. But this is sort of a different analysis that builds upon the, the sort of psychoanalytical or what you could call a psychological analysis from the first movie of, of the corporation as a psychopath. And one of the things we, we see in this movie is that that corporations have started to sort of play the good guy. Oh, I'm, cha I'm changing. I'm doing the, my best to sort of be the good guy now. Why do, why, do we, why do we believe this rhetoric or rather should we see this moment as the sort of Me Too moment, moment of, of capitalism that we're calling out toxic behavior uh, that has been that, or that we've been in an abusive relationship with these corporations for such a long time? I'll, I'll, maybe I, I, I should mean, start I think with we're you, at a very, Sure, I think we're at a, I mean, first, let me just say how much I uh, enjoyed the uh, the commentary from from uh, from Jazz and Christian and and Solomon. Um, I thought this was supposed to be a debate, but I agree with everything. I think <laughs> the the points about intersectionality uh, that Jasmine's made, uh, the disproportionate impact of climate change. You know, we had a whole section on that that we had to lift out once the pandemic hit because we needed to make room in the film for talking about the pandemic. But what we did is we used our discussion of the pandemic to get at those intersectionality issues as, as much as we, we possibly could, uh, while also making the point that, you know, if you think the pandemic is bad, wait what's around the corner in terms of, of climate change. Um, and, and Solomon's points are, are absolutely right. I mean, we feature the Sunrise Movement, for example, because they're so important in inspiring change. We look at the, the school children who are uh, in the streets protesting, and, and it's really crucial. And, and, uh, and, you know, Christian, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we have to do more in civil society than, than simply lobby government. I think one of the important points of the film is that in a way what we have to break down is the the sort of um, uh, fortitudes or, or, or silos um, between civil society and politics and official politics. It's not a coincidence that we look at people like Ada Kolau, uh, Shama Sawant. We look at politicians who are movement-based politicians trying to make the point uh, that Yes, struggle is a constant daily process, and and what we need is is to make, um, uh, to 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 find sort of political democratic formations, which I think is partly what Bernie Sanders was aiming at. What we're seeing with the Green New Deal ideas uh, that are being picked up by Biden, we need to really integrate. Uh, movements uh, around climate, around justice, about racial justice, economic justice, the intersection of all of those things um, with our politics, rather than seeing our governments as these sort of things that sit on high and we have to bang on the door and hopefully have some success every four years. Um, ideally, we have to integrate those worlds. That is the thesis of the film. It's what we try to get at. I feel awful that we were unable, I mean, I had a whole sequence on Jackson, Mississippi, and the cooperative movement in Jackson and Mayor Lumumba and how he's how he's working with that and and uh, and you know and and Vandana Shiva's work in India uh, with with farming and we get at we get at it barely in looking at the idea of mutual aid around the pandemic. But you're absolutely right, Christian, that there is this incredible work going on in civil society. Uh, and, you know, that is part of what was left on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. In terms of your question, Henrik, um, it is, I think, the point of this film to say that we are being gaslit. 
um, that this is a case of, of big corporations having found the charm of the psychopath. And we even make a little play about how the American Psychiatric Association sort of introduced charm as another diagnostic idea in 2011. Um, and that we are being charmed into believing that we can sort of move beyond democracy uh, and, and rely upon um, big business to take us to a world uh, of, uh, you know, climate okayness and of justice. And, you know, we just saw Jamie Dimon, who features in the film, uh, standing up and talking about how he's so committed to justice and equality and all of these issues. And so um, for me, we're really at a, at a kind of interesting point where on the one hand, we see these civil society movements, these social justice movements, these democratic movements that we feature in the film. And there are so many more cooperative movements, farmers movements in India. Like we just see an incredible just bursting out of this kind of uh, sentiment around climate, around justice, all of this. And at the same time, we see the corporate sector saying, you know, gaslighting us and saying, we hear you. We we're on the same page with you. Um, just sort of hand us the keys to all those problems. It's not about empowering people. It's about giving us greater authority to lead on those issues. And I think, you know, it's a seductive message. And the reason for the film and book is to try to show uh, it's dangerously seductive. Um, and and so we we really need to keep doing all of this work to um, to show that the kind of change we need is only going to come from the people and from movements. It's not going to come from the corporate sector. Can I just, um, for you, Jasmine, the, this intersectionality of, of things regarding race, gender, class, and, and so on, the corporations are also, like global corporations like Nike and so on, they're also speaking into this this uh, sort of modern uh, idea of of uh, of of what you call uh, of of looking at uh, at at we we see both the 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 communication and also the backlash against it. For example, the Gillette commercials about toxic masculinity and so on. We have uh, we have m modes of communications f that sort of speak into what we're talking about the problematic. How 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 do you how do you reflect over that as someone who actually organizes on the ground along these lines um you know for me it's really about um there's this saying are you just talking the talk or are you actually walking the walk um the fact that you brought up nike i think that is a good example um nike i do believe is walking the walk in several social justice areas um, you know, they have stood up for Colin Kaepernick. Um, I don't need to go into detail here on this panel, but um, he raised awareness to uh, police brutality here in America. And, um, you know, they have uplifted him. They have uplifted several um, women athletes and, you know, created inspiring videos um, to showcase these women. Um, I was telling someone earlier today that every great social justice movement started on the grassroots level. Um, that's with everything. It started in your community. Um, and so my suggestion would be for people when you are analyzing whether you're part of an you're part of an organization or you're an individual and you are trying to determine if a company or an organization is truly walking the walk. Um, are they wanting to get their hands dirty? Are they actually wanting to um, be part of your efforts in the community? Um, it's not about how much money they're going to make off of you. It's more about what is the impact going to be? Um, are there um, intentional um, translational things that we can do around the country and across the world? Um, and, and so that, I would say those are my reflections. And uh, m moving on to Solomon, maybe you could could uh, from the political uh, analysis, from that standpoint of being a politician, at the end of the rainbow, let's see we actually 
get to a place where we solve a lot of these problems? Is there room, is there a place for corporations at the end of the rainbow? I think there is. I think that there are different models. Like Joel mentioned, uh, cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives make a lot of sense. And you could have a very similar, like basic idea of a capitalist system and all the companies could be cooperatives or nonprofits. Um, we've got one in the U.S., Newman's own, is own, owned by a nonprofit foundation. And I don't know whether that's a, the, the best example in the world, but having different structures to change the actual incentives for who profits and uh, how people are treated. Um, that could be a very powerful tool. I also think that if you have governments that are strong enough and have good regulations and tax corporations sufficiently, um, then there are a lot of companies that, whether it's the best system or not, it would be perfectly fine to have companies out there pursuing a profit motive where that doesn't directly mean something that's bad for the world. Uh, companies that do things where them making more profit also does good for people or isn't bad for people as long as they're well regulated and taxed. I, I see that being perfectly fine in, in an ideal world. And uh, Christian, I'd like to ask you, so as as uh, an NGO working for social justice, you ha you're you relying on on the the internet, on, on social media and so on both for, for fundraising, but also for mobilizing uh, people in the streets and so on. And sort of traditionally, the streets have been this key uh, stage for political organizing a along progressive lines. But today, the online world has become sort of a key battleground. But in a large, to a large extent, this battleground is controlled by large corporations, you know, Facebook, Google, and so on and so forth, as the, films, as the film shows. Can the master's tools dismantle the master's house, to use a phrase from, from uh, Audre Lorde? Um, well, probably not. I think, I think that's what we've learned throughout the, uh, the last 10 years, for example. Uh, I mean, if you just remember 10 years ago, we thought that it was Twitter and Facebook that were going to give us revolutions around the, the, uh, the Middle East, uh, led by people uh, and so on. Um, and then five years later or seven years later, we had the Cambridge Analytica scandal and, and the rest is kind of history. Uh, so I think we have to find alternatives uh, to, um, to, the, to the big five, as they're called, uh, the big tech companies that are running most of our digital infrastructure. Um, but I think we also have to remember that, that organizing and struggles take place in, in different places. Uh, and the web is definitely one. Uh, but I don't think the web alone is, is a strong enough place in the sense that uh, we still need to be together and we, we need to meet in physical places. Uh, and if we, if we only rely on, um, on, on, on the web, so to speak, then I think the struggles are going to be more difficult. Uh, if you look at in historically, you know, where, where, was it, where was the easiest place to organize and to actually have counter power? It was the factory. And that was because you could have 500 people in the same place. And if they chose to strike instead of work, then production was halted and it had a material consequence. Um, and that's one of the difficulties of, of the times that we're living in now that work is becoming more dispersed uh, and part of the future looks like everything will, everyone will be working through an app and so on. And that is gonna make organizing uh, more difficult. Uh, but I think, I, I actually think part of the key is to, to link the struggles with the political world uh, personally, I, I used to work in politics as well, uh, and I, I do actually believe in, in electoral democracy. Uh, and I think even these days there are positive things happening. Uh, I mean, we're recording this in, in April, uh, and um, over the last week I've been excited about what's been happening from Janet Yellen, uh, the, uh, the Treasury Secretary uh, of the U.S. Uh, on taxation. She's been saying things that uh, European progressives uh, would, dare, would, dare, would almost not say. And she's been saying it in a way where I've been considering whether it was Bernie Sanders and AOC's um, media people who have been making her line. She's been talking about changing the games, the game and not competing with Bahamas and Switzerland on low taxes and so on. So I actually want to say I'm a bit optimistic these days. Uh, I didn't think the Biden administration would be transformative. Um, half a year ago, but but three months into 2020, 2021, I have to say that it looks like they're going to do way more progressive politics than the, than the Obama administration, for example. 
but of course, we we got to remember that only you know it only it only lives through this moment of crisis of COVID crisis if there are strong enough uh, forces that that keeps it there and and that as part of what civil society have to do and where we have to cooperate as civil society, whether it's trade unions, whether it's NGOs, whether it's um, it's all different kinds of stations. I'd like uh, just to, before we round off, I'd like just a quick fire round from all four of you um, to this question, which is kind of a yes, no question, but you can, you can, you can qualify it. But is in general, are you optimistic about reigning in the uh, power the democra like of democracies reigning in the power of, of corporations. I'll start with uh, with you, Joel. Uh, yes, I am, and and not least because of what Christian was just talking about. I think that what we're seeing is some of the ideas at the end of the film, and some of the politicians, Bernie Sanders, Shama Swan, Adekola, uh, AOC. We're seeing those kinds of ideas becoming mainstream. I, I think that the Treasurer Secretary in the United States, the the plan for a sort of 21% floor corporate tax, uh, international treaties to do that, the idea of, of working at the international level, the domestic level, regional levels, local levels, um, and and the sense I think that this crisis has brought that uh, that a real a uh, course uh, recorrection, a uh, reset is needed. Um, I think all of that makes me very optimistic. The massive protests concerning climate change, concerning racial justice, um, increasing awareness. I, I'm very optimistic. And uh, Jasmine, very shortly. Yes, I'm. I'm also very optimistic. Um, Generation Z and millennials are some of the most knowledgeable people um, I have been in contact with and work with um, each and every day. Um, I'm optimistic about the creativity of solutions that it's going to take to combat and mitigate the climate crisis. Um, and I'm optimistic in the policies that we are putting into place and the implementation pathways that are gonna go all the way down from the international level, national, regional, in the local state level. Solomon? Yeah, I'm also hopeful. I don't know if it's gonna be a smooth road, but I, I am very confident that we'll get there and we seem to be moving in the right direction at the moment. And finally, Christian? Yeah, I'm partly optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic because I know that it can happen. History has shown that we have taken, we've made paradigm shifts. Um, after the Great Depression, uh, the building up of the of the welfare state after the Second World War, but I'm also cautious because I was optimistic in 2010 uh, when we'd had the big financial crisis and everyone could see that the financial world didn't work well and that it created havoc. And then a couple of years later, we were back to you know an even worse place than before the financial crisis. So I'm I'm pessimistic in the sense that I know that this moment can be squandered as well. Uh, and uh, and it's nothing happens automatically, and we have to struggle for for the progress this time around as well. Thank you so much for participating. This is unfortunately all we have time for today. Um, but uh, Jasmine, Solomon, Joel, and Christian, thank you so much for participating in this panel, um, and thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.